Good morning and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're thankful that you are choosing to worship God in your home. And we are thankful that this technology can bring us a little closer together in these difficult circumstances. I'm Joey Sparks with the Parish Church of Christ in Parish, Alabama. And we want you to know that we're thankful for you. We're thankful for so many of our good members who are staying in touch, helping one another. We're thankful that you are concerned about how to show love to each other. We're also thankful for those from our community, maybe those from around the world who may be watching. Thank you for choosing to watch. Please reach out to us if we can help you in any way. Over 3,400 years ago, Israelite families living in Egypt slaughtered a young goat or sheep and painted its blood on their doorposts. They cooked the meat over a fire. They sat down as a family and ate that meat, along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They had their shoes on, they had their clothes on, and they were told to eat in haste. They were in a tense and anxious moment, told to stay in their houses even until it was clear. They did not know what their short-term future, much less their long-term future, would hold but they had been told what to do in order to be protected by God and what to do to prepare for escape. Escape would come, you would remember. The Jews would remember, and they would remember every year. See, in the instructions for how to prepare for that night, God also told these Israelites how and when to remember this very deliverance. So for a week, they would eat unleavened bread. And then on one specific day, they would eat the feast of the Passover. They were remembering this final plague when all the firstborn sons of families and livestock were killed overnight in Egypt while the Lord passed over the homes of the Jews. If our calendars are accurate today in, in being synchronized with past calendars, it's this very week ahead of us, some 1,400 years following the Israelite deliverance from Egypt and about 2,000 years ago, that Jesus would be with his closest disciples, the apostles, in order to celebrate Passover. As Jews, their minds and their hearts were carried back not only to the anxious days of their forefathers, but especially the remembrance of that deliverance out of Egypt and eventually being led into the promised land. And so while they sat celebrating God's physical deliverance of his people, they did not know the anxieties they would face in just a matter of hours and that would last through the weekend. Their short-term future was one of pain and distress. They did not know that, but Jesus did. Jesus sat among them in silent agony knowing what he would face, what was necessary for him to endure. He was preparing himself, but also preparing them for them to see and to know his love, and then to know an even greater deliverance than God had given the Israelites almost 1,500 years prior. Today, April 2020, we gather together in the presence of the Lord not knowing our short-term future in the midst of these uncertain circumstances. And while that dynamic seems especially acute in the moment right now, we must always remember that we never know our short-term future circumstances. But thanks be to God that we get to worship and gather alongside He who does know and does control the future and who has secured our future inheritance in Christ. We do anticipate his return. And while we do, we proclaim his death and his resurrection, which provide that very path for our deliverance from the terror of sin. This morning, we're going to organize our time a little differently than the past couple of weeks. We hope that you have your copy of God's Word with you, as we will look at several passages together in conjunction with each aspect of worship. God guides the aspects of our worship through His written Word in the New Testament, the New Covenant established by His Son, 
Jesus. But each of these aspects were also a part of Israel's deliverance from Egypt, as we'll observe this morning. So we will partake of the Lord's Supper or communion together. We will sing and pray together. And we will remind ourselves about the privilege of giving in order to help carry out the work and the needs of the church. Let's open our time together, setting our minds in the Word of God by reading Exodus 15. We'll begin in verse 11. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. As we work our way through these aspects this morning, there's one other consideration I think is exciting to think about. In the heart of God's instructions to the Israelites about their preparation, not only did He tell them how to celebrate and remember that deliverance in future years, He also told them that their children would ask, what does all this mean? And then He tells them how to respond. Listen to Exodus 12, beginning verse 24. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt when he struck the Egyptians but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Isn't that great? After God tells them what to do to be delivered, after he tells them how to remember it every year, and after he tells them how to respond to their children when they ask, the people are humbled and they bowed their heads and worshipped. This process was an ongoing thing. God would remind them multiple times in the books to come, Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, here's how you tell your children what you're doing. I'm guessing our current present-day circumstances of worshiping in our homes may be providing some additional opportunities for more question-asking by our children and by one another. And we hope and pray that's the case. What a blessing. And what an opportunity it is to be able to answer that question. What's the meaning of this? Why do we do this? And to be able to answer that question from the Word of God. So that's what we will attempt to do in our time together this morning. Earlier this week, our daughters were outside playing with a neighbor, with a neighbor friend out on our swing set. And all three were swinging at the same time. And I walked by in front of them to toss something into the woods. And they all three started yelling and telling me something. So needless to say, I was quite overwhelmed and bombarded for those few moments. Because I had no idea what any of them was actually saying. Isn't it wonderful that God is able to keep all the various prayers and messages prayed to Him straight? that no matter where we're praying from around the globe at any given time, God promises to hear. But isn't it also wonderful that when we all pray together, we have the blessing of knowing God hears. See, if I had walked by our swing set and our three girls had screamed the exact same message together in unison, wouldn't that have really gotten my attention? So personal prayer is great and powerful. But so too collective corporate prayer is special and powerful in times of worship. With that in mind, listen to how God tells us this whole episode begins with the Israelites in Egypt. This is Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died. And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. Look at verses 24 and 25 again. Notice the three senses 
The progression here, he heard, he saw, he knew. Then again, listen to chapter 3 and verse 7. God says this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who were in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land. Did you see it back in verse 7? I have seen, have heard, I know their sufferings. Do we hear the power in that? That God heard. They were crying out because of their hardship, and God heard those cries. God, hearing their collective cries, spurred him to act on their behalf and to grant them, provide them this powerful deliverance. What a blessing it now is that God hears our every prayer and our every cry to Him. And what a blessing that we can join our prayers and cries to Him together to bring them before the throne of God. We see a powerful example of that happening in the New Testament in Acts chapter 4. Peter and John have been released from Jewish custody and the church celebrates by being all together and then praying together. Verse 29, the close of their prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Obviously, there are some differences in terms of the miraculous era they were still a part of that has now transitioned and ceased to our complete knowledge to the Word of God. But notice that example and that promise, their prayer for boldness, and God then granting them that power and strength to preach with boldness. Right now, in the midst of our quarantining, our distancing, what a great blessing and promise it is now that we can pray, but also pray together, knowing that we're, we're all uniting in our prayers to reach the throne of God. As we do pray together this morning, Leslie Ernest has asked that we pray for her cousin's daughter named Zoe Phillips. She's a nine-year-old, and she was admitted to Children's Hospital yesterday. Scary times for them. We also continue to pray for Don and Susan Guthrie as they take care of Don's mother, Gertrude Guthrie. Continue to pray for Grace Gray and Tommy's family in his passing last week. And also pray for Gail and Ray Bruner, we mentioned last week also, Roger's sister and brother-in-law. Shall we now pray together? Father, we come before you with so many different swirling emotions. And right now we pray that we will focus all of those and maybe even needing to eliminate some of those emotions in order to dwell on, dwell in our thanksgiving to you. We thank you for being the great God that you are and for being good and righteous and kind. We thank you that you have never changed your nature, your character, your love, or your power. And we're thankful for the opportunity to worship you on this, the first day of the week. We thank you that many of us can be connected through technology this morning, even though we are separated by space. We pray that we will focus our efforts this day on giving our worship to you. We come before you praying for our nation, for our state, for our local community, and for the entire world. We pray that leaders will act responsibly and courageously. We pray that researchers will, and experts will advise respectfully and with, with wisdom. We pray for healthcare workers, medical professionals who are so often carrying out measures that can make the difference in life and death. We pray for each of us as citizens to be loving and respectful and patient and ultimately responsible and unselfish. We pray for our parish church family. We pray that you will continue to keep each of us safe, protect us from the virus, help us to bounce back from seasonal allergies and other things that can often slow us down this time of year. We pray for our healthcare professionals and first responders from parish. And we pray that you will keep them safe and grant them rest and help them to continue to love and serve with compassion. 
pause this morning to pray specifically for Leslie's cousin Zoe. Grant her recovering health. Pray that she will bounce back from her illness. Bless her family as they wait and as they long for her to get well soon. We continue to pray for Don and Susan and for Gertrude Guthrie. Pray for Grace Gray and the rest of Tommy's family. We pray for Gail and Ray Bruner. We pray for so many others who need your blessings and your strength. We pray that we will seek you and seek your word at all times. We pray that we will lean on you through this avenue of prayer at all times. And we pray that we will live out love, love that loves as you have loved at all times. We pray that this morning you will hear and accept our worship. We're thankful to do so as your children. And we thank you for the power of our collective, united prayers coming together before you and to your ear. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're thankful for this privilege to approach you through him. And it's in him. We pray together. Amen. Now we'll sing, My Only Hope is You. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus, my only peace is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only peace is you. My only joy is you, Jesus, my only joy. Thank you to a couple of deacons. One deacon has really helped us to have a stockpile of basic necessities in terms of food. We thank him for taking care of that. So please reach out to us if you find yourself needing food, some basic staples. We have plenty of that, and we'll get that to you as quickly as you let us know. Also, another one of our great deacons helped us to figure out how we could project the words here on the screen. And we appreciate him for doing that, getting the copyright issues kind of sorted through and finding this service for us. And so we appreciate him and we appreciate all of our deacons and, and servants who are helping us in these kind of unprecedented and uncertain times. Thank you so much for your hard work. Symbols, kind of placeholders, are so abundant. They saturate our daily lives. They saturate almost all forms of communication, literature, art. A lot of times, symbols are very basic, and they are such in order to get us to remember and just some know some, some very basic operating principles. And so we're driving down the road or down the interstate, and we see some symbols on signs, and that helps us to know where to go. We, we go to use the restroom, and we see the different symbols on the doors, and so forth. There's daily life, we use symbols often to communicate just basic operating principles. But when it comes to God, God has authored the Word of God in such a way that it is filled with symbols. When God would work through His people and communicate His will to them, He would give them and set up 
symbols within that system of obedience. For God, He's doing far more than just giving us a simple memory cue with symbols, though. God takes symbols, and through them, He communicates much deeper truths. Yes, these symbols are cues to remember, but they are also a means to engage us in a much deeper understanding of vital truths we need for our souls. Psalm 34 uses some symbolic language that becomes interesting to, to see woven through Scripture. Psalm 34, verse 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus would call us what two things in the Sermon on the Mount? The light of the world, the salt of the earth. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Likewise, in the elements of the Lord's Supper, when we commune together in the feast of the Lord, we have two elements. And through each of those, we can see, but also taste, that God has been and continues to be good to us through Jesus. In eating the bread together, we eat unleavened bread. Back on that night of the Passover in Egypt, the Israelites ate unleavened bread with their lamb, and with those herbs. That night when they left, they carried their unleavened dough in their bowls. See, it was partly functional. It was easiest to leave and to leave quickly if they just had to grab the untainted dough in their bowl. But it would also become a hallmark of that remembrance of the Passover. While it was functional that night, it became a symbol for many years into the future. Exodus 12, verse 17, You shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened, and all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. There it's God giving them instructions for that unleavened part of the feast and all these years to follow. See, the reason he did that is because leavening and thus leavened bread, they were staples of the Israelite home for almost the entire year. And they were eating cert even certain offerings that they would give to the Lord abiding by the law, that used leavened bread. But it was during this week and this feast, they were to throw out all leavening agents, yeast or, or whatever it may have been, and they were not to bake or eat unleavened bread. So you can hear the situation, right? You can hear those inevitable questions, especially from children, can't you? Why do we do it this way? What's different about this week? Now, because it possesses a unique purity when compared with leavened bread, because it carries their minds and their hearts back to the night they were delivered, you see what's happened? What could have easily, ordinarily been seen as bland, insignificant, now is a symbol for something far greater in their minds. And it's the bread of this feast, the feast of the Passover, on this very occasion, that Jesus would say to his apostles, and thus cementing for us how we are to observe the supper today. He would say this about that bread. When he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we eat this unleavened bread, we are remembering the flesh that Jesus willingly gave up and endured pain within just for us. And as we do so, we remember him. And we remember that precious body. What a symbol unleavened bread is. A symbol of deliverance through the body of Christ. Now we will pray for the unleavened bread. 
before we partake of it together. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we come to you right now thanking you for the bread that we have before us. We thank you that it represents the body of Jesus. We're thankful that we can partake of it and we can look and see it. We can also taste it knowing that you have given your son and his flesh for us. We're thankful for his body and we're thankful that it hung on the cross, that it endured pain, that it was mistreated so brutally. Help us to remember, remember that body and remember that price that was paid for us. Help us to remember solemnly, help us to proclaim his death, but also to anticipate his return. We're thankful that we get to eat this each week, anticipating his return. Bless us as we eat, bless our hearts and our minds. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the directives that God would give about the Feast of the Passover, we don't see a clear command through Scripture about the nature of the drink. But Jesus helps us out in those Lord's Supper institution texts in the Gospel accounts. What He does is He calls what they are drinking out of their cups, He calls it fruit of the vine or grape juice. And then what Jesus does is connects it to His blood. See, they could not have thought about Passover without also thinking about blood. That pure young sheep or goat was drained of its blood. And then with a branch of a hyssop plant, they would paint it all around their doors. And you can imagine, just as has been the case with blood throughout God's sacrificial systems to His people, it's not a clean thing to do. It's not nice and tidy and easy. Blood is going to get everywhere. So just think about the sights of those men and boys coming in the house after having slaughtered that young animal. Then after painting, flinging, and splattering that blood all over their doors. The sights, the smells, even the sounds would have been pungent, unmissable. So over the years for the Jews, it was that experience that they were bringing themselves back to Each year, when they saw the presence of that pure, spotless, sacrificial blood, they knew it protected their lives from the wrath of God. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, God would say. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You know, when we look at the cup, the fruit of the vine, it's almost impossible to not think about blood when we see those rich, dark tones that comes from juicing the grapes. The pigments in the grape skins saturate throughout that juice. They stain all that they come in contact with. Throughout the centuries, those who would sacrifice to God would use blood and and spread blood all over everything, and it would stain, it would saturate all that they touched. And now Jesus' blood, the blood of a perfect sacrifice, it too changes everything it touches. And just as we pour it out in order to consume it, so too He poured out His blood on our behalf. Jesus, back in Luke 22, verse 20, likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup 
that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. When we drink this juice, we can visually and then with taste experience a constant reminder that Jesus gave His blood for our forgiveness and to establish the new covenant agreement with us. And now let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Dear Heavenly Father, we again come to you thanking you for this cup. We thank you for the juice. Thankful that the fruit of the vine represents to us as Christians the blood of Jesus. We thank you for it. We pray that you'll bless us as we drink. Help us to look at it. Help us as we taste it to carry our minds and our hearts back to the cross, knowing that blood that was shed by Jesus purchases us, redeems us from our sins. It's the blood that establishes this new covenant. We're thankful to be able to share in this cup around your table with Jesus, with you, with each other. We're thankful for that privilege. Help us and humble us as we partake to do so with, with humility, going back to the cross, but also in anticipation for the day in which he will return. We're grateful for blessing us in him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So I have a preacher friend who noticed a young little girl where he preaches, and he said he, he watched her as she gave one Sunday morning during the contribution, and he learned a lot from her. She was waiting, and she had her hand clenched, and as the tray came by, she opened her hand, and nothing happened. Nothing fell out. And so she looked, and what had happened was those few coins that she'd been holding on to had stuck to the palm of her sweaty little hand. So she pried those coins off and eventually got them to fall into the tray. And as she did, she noticed the man in the aisle was waiting on the tray, but he was waiting patiently and smiling. And so she grabbed the tray and handed it to him, and she smiled at him and said, Thank you. Isn't that neat? She was the one who was giving, but she was also the one saying, Thank you. Isn't that an attitude? that should guide our giving to the work of the Lord? That attitude that says, thank you. Interestingly, Paul, he has those two chapters in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. He closes that section. The very last verse in chapter 9 is when he says, thanks be to God for His inexpressible gift. See, our generosity is fueled by our thanksgiving for all that God has done and for all He continues to do, for all God has given and for all He continues to give. When the multitude of Israelites would leave Egypt, God would, of course, we know, take care of them with food and water in the wilderness. But He had also told them how to have and provide for themselves financially. Listen back to chapter 12 when they would leave. This is verse 35. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. See, when they left, they did not leave empty-handed. God was thorough and making sure they were prepared for life after leaving. They had much to be thankful to God for when they left. And you would remember that throughout the time of the Old Testament law, their sacrificial system was defined by a single word, offering. See, what they would offer to God would always come out of what God had given them. When we think about us and our giving today, 
God doesn't merely command us to give to Him and to the work of the church, but He invites us to give out of whatever situation we're in. And thus, in doing so, we are able to grow in our giving and grow into becoming more and more like Him. Paul's plea with the Corinthian church back in those two chapters of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 was that they would follow through with their desire, meaning they had wanted to give in the past and had expressed that desire, but now it was time. It was time to act on that desire even if their situation looked different from when they had originally committed to that desire. And so it's times like this that we are in right now that will no doubt challenge us in our giving. But that's when we will also grow the most in our giving. We want to be clear that that we know and understand, and the Lord knows and understands, that there are many people right now who are financially hurting, financially scared right now. And we need to remember that God specifies that we give when we have been prospered. But that said, He also shows us the power and potential for growing when we give out of our struggles. The Macedonian church listed there in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul communicates clearly that they had given even in the midst of their, quote, severe test of affliction. So that means we need to be prayerful to be sure that we're not merely just cutting back our giving only because maybe things are a little tighter for a few weeks. Since we are to give to Him first, it should also be the last area that we cut. Maybe we have some extra means to give. Then this might very well be the best time in order to give that extra so that it offsets any giving that has to, to kind of come down because of people's cutbacks. Again, we don't want to portray that we're overly concerned about the church's finances. We, we, we know the Lord will bless us when we are honest, when we are generous, no matter how that looks. But we also don't want to unintentionally just happenstance grow in our selfishness during this time. We want to ensure and be intentional that we are prayerfully and faithfully growing in our generosity. And we thank so many of you for continuing that contribution toward the Lord's work in His church these past few weeks. We know that we are a people that God continues to bless and bless abundantly. Reminder, as you give this week, mail your your check, your contribution, to our P.O. Box. That's P.O. Box 118 in Parish 35580. Let's pause for a moment to pray about our giving. Father, we pray to you thanking you for your abundant love toward us, especially at this time, at how it is evident and how you've bountifully blessed us financially and physically. We understand that times when those are are tight or when those are taken away from us, they bring us to a greater appreciation for all you give. Right now, we pray that you'll help us to consider all aspects of our lives as we consider also this opportunity to keep growing in our generosity in order to be more like you. We do pray that you will bless those who are hurting, struggling financially in this moment. We pray that you'll help them to remain vigilant and steadfast, persevere. We pray that you'll bless us all uh, to seek your word, and to seek you in prayer, so that we are as responsible and as careful with all that we do, so that we can give our best and our most to you and to the work of the church as we spread the gospel and strengthen your church. Right now, we pray that you'll help us and challenge us to remember the gift of Christ. When we think about our giving, we are most thankful for Him. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen. The Star-Spangled Banner, our national anthem, didn't really become a fixture at sporting events until Major League Baseball began singing it prior to games in 1918 during World War I. Beginning then in 2001, Major League Games added the singing of God Bless America in the seventh inning stretch. And then a specific team, the Boston Red Sox, 
They galvanized what had been a fun tradition with significant emotion when Neil Diamond himself came back and led their fans through Sweet Caroline in the days following the Boston Marathon bombing. See, songs, singing, they have great power to unite. They are easily and powerfully intertwined with our experiences and our memories. For the Israelites, it's no different. It's the first thing recorded about the Israelites after God brings them safely through the Red Sea and then defeats the Egyptians. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. The text from which we read as we opened our time of worship this morning from Exodus 15 is from this song of Moses as well. See, they had much to celebrate and much to be thankful for, and they sang about it. They did what James would tell us to do. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Christians today, we have much for which we are thankful. We have much to be cheerful about, much to celebrate. One of the great privileges of worship is to sing, to take beautiful, profound spiritual truths and give them life, artistic expression through melodies, harmonies, and voices blending and stacking together. Listen to how the Hebrews writer would describe it. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. We are thankful to be able to sing together. I know we look forward to the day in the near future when we can once again sing together back in our building. But won't our memories be sweet of these times when we were able to sing familiar, touching songs in our homes, knowing that our church family doing the same all around town? Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Wound in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus around the throne, and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse who sing who never knew our God, but children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to fairer worlds on high, to fairer worlds on high. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. We're mar this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The 
angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. In 1962, bank robbers Frank Morris, two brothers, John and Clarence Anglin, escaped from Alcatraz, that federal penitentiary on an island just off the coast of Northern California. They were last seen hopping onto a raft they had constructed using rain jackets. No one was ever able to confirm whether they made it to the coast safely or if they perished in the waters. In order to escape that prison, because it's on an island, they had to cross the water. So too, for the Israelites some 3,400 years ago, in order to faithfully escape Egypt and enter that peninsula where their promised land was located, it meant escaping by crossing through the water. It's at the shore of the Red Sea that this mass multitude of people are given over to fear. They think they cannot go any farther. They see the Egyptians coming back after them in the distance. But it's here God provides deliverance, and He does so through the water. Exodus 14, verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove back the sea by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned to cover the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. Today, in the era of the new covenant through Jesus Christ, anyone who hears the gospel message, that message, the good news about the Son of God who lived in the flesh, then died, sacrificial death for sin, then conquered death through His resurrection, and then who is willing to put his or her life to death to sin, that person, for that person, the only way of escape is through the water. God makes that path and the plan clear. And it means passing through the water's Baptism. It's in the New Testament that Peter, the Apostle Peter, would point to another moment in the history of God's people, one prior to this of the Exodus deliverance. He would point back to Noah when he and his family, eight souls in total, were, quote, brought safely through water. He would say in verse 21, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. One popular translation says it this way, this water symbolizes baptism. That now saves you. Do you hear that? 
What he's saying is Noah's salvation by water, and we can also infer likewise the Israelites' salvation by water is a symbol of the greater reality now in Christ, that of baptism. You'll notice this grammar is simple in that verse. Baptism is the subject of the sentence. Baptism now saves you. Sin is a far more ruthless taskmaster than Pharaoh, and yet God still provides escape. God still provides deliverance, and He does so through water. Have you obeyed Christ? What about you? Have you contacted His blood by passing through the water of baptism? If you've not made that decision to obey Jesus Christ, then please do not put it off any longer. Even though our times right now are a little scary, a little uncertain in the moment, they are still not as scary as being lost in sin and in the grip of the devil. You can come out today. You can enjoy deliverance today. Please call me, text me, call one of the elders. Please reach out to us so that we can assist you in making this life-changing and eternity-altering decision. If you have once obeyed that gospel, but you have begun to live in a way that's not within keeping with it, you've begun to live in sin, you can come back to Him as well. You do not have to wait. We would love to send out a message to the church telling everyone to rejoice, celebrate, over your repentance and forgiveness. Please, please do not wait. Let's all be thankful for the escape God gives through Jesus. And let's be sure that we are enjoying it and living faithfully within it. We'll sing our final two songs. Lead me to some soul today, and then I know the Lord will find a way for me. Lead me to some soul today, oh teach me Lord just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care and few pray together again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of today, for the beauty of the day itself, but also the day as it represents the beginning of the week. We pray that we'll give you our most. We pray that we'll give you our best this first day. And we pray that you'll help us to have a great day and a great week. We're thankful that we can come together through worship. The aim to please you, the aim to bring you honor and praise that you are so deserving of. Right now we pray for us to have strength and wisdom in the days ahead. Help us to make the most of our time at home. Help us to be respectful by staying at home. Help us to be servants who look out for the needs of other people. Help us to be loving in our actions and our thoughts, our motives. We thank you for this privilege of worship and for our church family. Continue to bless and strengthen us in all that we do to seek your will and to give you the glory. We're thankful most of all for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you again for your time. Please know that our communication can, together continues to be of utmost importance. We encourage you uh, to spend some time this afternoon praying, but also texting and calling and reaching out in various ways to, to one another as a part of our church family. Maybe it's good to check in with people that we would ordinarily talk to, but maybe today's a good day to, to think about some people across the room from where we normally see it. Who is it that I've not talked to in a few weeks because we've not been together? It's a great day to act on that. Make some calls and send some texts. That'd be fantastic. Also, remember that notes and cards are still great and encouraging. The post office is still running, so that's a great idea and thought as well. Let's be sure that we're keeping on living out the things that we wish we would do if we had more time. Let's be sure that we connect to one another, and please know that, that we want you to reach out to us and connect to us if you find yourself in need. Know that we love you, and know that we are always here for you. We wish you the best, especially God's best, this day and this week.